All right. As we prepare our hearts and minds for the message, I would like to invite Le Prince on up to the microphone. Le Prince is going to share with us our final reading for today, which is going to serve as the basis of our message. And he's going to get to share about who we are and what we're capable of because of God, not just because of ourselves. Go ahead, Le Prince. <clears throat> A lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. This is the word of the Lord. Awesome. Thank you so much, Le Prince. It's so interesting that in this message series, as we have been taking a look at what it means to be loved and what it means to be sent, that we have been focusing on three key statements that we hear from the voices of our culture as well as our own inner voices. And there are these three key statements that you see on the screen. I am what I do. I am what I have. And I am what people say about me. Now, as we look at these three key statements, though, it's easy to see why we might be tempted to believe and to think these statements are true. After all, isn't it true that whenever we're getting together with um, people that oftentimes we will ask them, hey, what do you do for a living? Right? That's a pretty common statement. Sometimes we also worry a lot about what other people think of us and what other people say of us, right? Like, for example, I'm worried about whether or not this message is going to reach not just your ears, but your heart today, right? Because I care about what you think, not just about me, but more importantly about Jesus. But it's real easy sometimes for me to make it all about me. Have you, have you ever struggled with that, of making life all about you? And that's why we need to understand that these are lies of the devil, powerful lies that he tries to use to shape our thoughts. And through shaping our thoughts, the devil knows that he can influence what we say, he can influence how we act, he can influence our integrity, he can influence our character, and the devil loves to be able to destroy our faith. And that's why it's so important for today to recognize that those lies would have no power over us if it weren't for our thought life. Those lies would have no power over us if it weren't for the fact that oftentimes what we believe about ourselves is actually what we say to ourselves. It's the inner dialogue that's going on in our minds each and every day. And that's why this is an important point to make today. And this point that we're making is going to influence everything else that I'm going to be talking about today. And notice that this is our fill-in. And by the way, you'll notice that there are fill-ins in your programs if you want to follow along and you can actually write these things in if you wish. Um, this is our fill-in. Our inner dialogue is our thoughts. It's not what we say about ourselves. It is what we say to ourselves. Now, we talked about this a little bit in our chapel on Friday with the, with the kids. And I used the illustration of what do you say to yourself when you look in the mirror, right? We all look in the mirror. <laughs> and for those of you who are old enough to remember this particular Saturday Night Live skit with Stuart Smalley, you'll probably remember the phrase that he would say. It was all part of his, um, you know, talking yourself up, uh, trying to get your thoughts right. And he said, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And that's what he would say over and over and over again to try to get himself and his thoughts in a proper frame of mind. I'm telling you, his words in that self-acclamation series of skits resonated with people. They resonated with people because we need to recognize that we are talking to ourselves all the time. And typically people only get concerned when we're talking to ourselves out loud. Am I not right? Right. 
Right. But we're talking to ourselves all the time. That's our thoughts. So we have to ask ourselves, though, what is influencing my thoughts then? And I want to bring this picture up on the screen because isn't it true that as we go through life, there are events that happen in our life, there are things that happen in our life, and we talk to ourselves about those things, right? So for example, if I do something that, is, that hurts someone and I feel really bad about it, what am I going to be saying to myself? I am ashamed. I am guilty. I am sorry. I am, right? There's all these I am things that we, we fill in the blank, right? And we need to understand that that will influence our emotions. We tend to talk ourselves up or down depending on what our emotions are. And then that can influence our words and our actions, which then ultimately becomes a part of our habits and our character that then will influence when another event, something else happens in our life, then we have more self-talk that becomes part of this vicious cycle if we don't interject God's talk into our thoughts. And that's the big point. That's the big point that we're going to be making as we think about this today. And so I want you now to look at the next fill-in here. And so we have to ask the question, what is my self-talk based on? And it's often based on my best or my worst moments. Right? So, for example, I know that some of you scholars uh, had a quiz this past week. Some of you might even had a test this past week. And if you aced the test, that's the event, right? If you aced the test, if you got an A plus on it, then you're going to probably think to yourself, uh-huh, I am good, right? I am successful. This is exactly what I wanted to achieve. If you fail the test, then say, I am fill in the blank, right? I am a failure. I can't believe I blew this test, and now I've got an F in this class, or, you know, whatever. The I am fill in the blank statements of what we say to ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, what am I basing my thoughts on? Am I basing my thoughts on this inner talk, this inner voice, this self-talk that is completely dependent on what is happening around me, or am I basing it on God? And I'm basing it on His Word. And this is the thing, is that the Apostle Paul, in this section that uh, Le Prince read before in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul was a follower of Jesus. And before he became a follower of Jesus, he based everything in his life on how good he was before God. He was a doer. He was a guy who said, oh, I'm getting right with God because of how good I am. But once he came to realize just how good Jesus is, Jesus is perfect, Paul wasn't. Jesus is the one who could fill all of Paul's needs. Paul couldn't do that. Then that's when he came to the realization, oh, this Jesus guy, he's pretty awesome to follow, right? And so he went from a murderer of Christians to a missionary for Christ. That's what he did. But when he wrote the, these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he wanted to remind his fellow Christians who had all these self-talk, all these thoughts too, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? Am I ashamed? Am I, you know, all these different thoughts. He wanted them to focus on the words of God. And notice what he said here in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 4 through 6. He said, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. So what he's saying here is, hey, dial down the volume of your inner talk, all these things you're saying to yourself that's getting you down, and dial up the voice of God. Turn up the volume of what God says about you, that he loves you with an undeserved love, which is, by the, by the way, what grace is. Grace is God's undeserved love. And so he was like, listen to the voice of God. And then Paul actually put that into practice because 
there were some other pastors that came into the midst of the church in Corinth and they began to bad talk Paul. They began to say, oh, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. Hey, people, you should follow us. Could you imagine that? If Pastor Borman and I, instead of being together, I would get up here and tell you Pastor Borman doesn't know what he's talking about. You should follow me. How do you think that's going to go over? Oh, you'd probably kick me out, right? Because, you, you know, he's been here longer. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. That's what was happening in the Corinthian church. And Paul could have told himself. He could have had the self-talk of saying, you know what? They're right. I I'm no good. I'm not good enough for this ministry. I may as well just take my bag and go home. But he didn't. In fact, what did he write? In his second letter to the Corinthian church, in chapter 2, verse 16, he asked this question. Who is equal to such a task? And so he's basically saying, hey, I'm not worthy of being a pastor of this church. Those people who are bad talking to me, they're not worthy of being a, a pastor of this church either. But God put me in this position. God wants me here to share the good news about Jesus. And so that's why he writes these amazing words that are going to be the foundation of our message again. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4 and 5, this is what he says. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now, in order to fully understand these words, we, we maybe need to define a couple of words that are in this section. The first word that I want to define is confidence. According to the dictionary, confidence just simply means to be full of conviction or, and here's the fill-in, self-reliance. Now, would you not agree that this appeals to us in a sense of, yeah, I can just do it myself. If you've ever had a toddler, and for many of you, you've had a toddler, and when you have a two-year-old who thinks they can put on their shoes and they don't want you to try to help them, to show them, what do they do? They just push, it, push you away and say, uh-uh, I got this. And then like 25 minutes later, maybe they've got their first shoe on, right? Like there's this desire to be independent, to be self-reliant. And the devil loves to influence our thoughts with that because here's the lie. Here's the lie. The devil's lie is that I can be confident without God. The devil's lie is that I can be confident without God. Now, true, there are lots of people. I mean, when you watch the NFL, you watch the major leagues in baseball, you watch the NBA, you, could, you see a lot of confident people, right? And not all of them have God in their lives. But you always have to ask yourself the question, how long does that confidence last? Right? How long does that confidence last? Let's bring these um, pictures up on the screen. So for example, I can be confident in my relationships as long as the relationships are going well. But the moment that I do something that I let down those I love, what does the self-talk say? The self-talk says, I'm no good. The self-talk says, I can't believe I did this, right? And then what happens if I lose my job? What does the self-talk say? The self-talk says, again, I can't believe this happened. What am I going to do, right? What about somebody who's losing their health and dying in the hospital? And they're losing that. They're losing the confidence in their own health. What do you do in those moments? Do your tell yourself what Stuart Smalley said? That doesn't do you any good, does it? It doesn't. Where does our confidence in life come from? Where does our hope come from? Because here's the truth. God's truth is that lasting confidence comes from God reliance. Lasting confidence comes from God reliance. Because the reality is that when we think about what that word reliance means, the word reliance, uh, the, the word confidence literally means to put my full weight on something or someone that I can fully depend on, fully rely on, be confident in that person. 
Now, I've got an example of what this looks like. Let's bring this up on the screen. So this is a well-known guy in the 1800s by the name of Blondin. And Blondin tightroped across the Niagara Falls. Kids, don't try this, right? So he tightroped across the Niagara Falls. And so people, he drew quite a crowd. People would want to go and see this guy in action as he's tightrope walking across the Niagara Falls. Raise your hand if you've ever been to the Niagara Falls. That's a long way across, all right? No way. Count me out. I ain't doing that, right? But one of the things that he would ask the crowd as they would gather there, he would always ask them, hey, how many of you think that I can make it all the way across and back? And of course, all the hands would go up because, you know, he was famous by this point. Then he would ask them, how many of you think that I can make it across and back with someone on my back? Again, most of them would keep their hands up. And then he'd ask them, which one of you would like to go first? All the hands went down. Because <laughs> they're like, uh-uh, not me. You go, you go. I ain't doing that, right? Like, be, and why? Because they didn't have confidence that they could rely on him to carry them across and back again. Let's bring this next picture on the screen. Do you realize that you can have full confidence in Jesus? That you can fully rely on him? Do you realize that thousands of years ago, God made literally hundreds of promises? They're called prophecies in the Old Testament. Do you realize that virtually every single one of them, except for the ones that are not yet uh, fulfilled, they will happen when Jesus returns in judgment on this world. But do you realize that nearly every single one of those prophecies was fulfilled in what Jesus came to do to save you and me from our sins. Our confidence in life doesn't need to come from self, which can be up and down, and come from all the experiences and events in life, which can come and go. Our confidence comes from Jesus who carries us. He carries us across the fires of hell. He carries us to the cross where he put our sins to death, where he paid the price for our sins. You don't have to carry around your shame and guilt anymore. You're forgiven. You're loved. That's your identity. That's the confidence we can experience with Jesus in our life. Now, Paul then goes on to talk about competence. And notice what he says in verse 5. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now, let's define what the word competence means. Competent means to be qualified and able to do something. So I'm putting a picture of cheesy potatoes up on the screen. I got to share this story with you. I, th let's put it this way. I, you would never want to, if you own a restaurant, you would never want to hire me to be your chef. Just saying. So I had just one thing to make for Christmas dinner. This was a bunch of years ago. One thing to make, cheesy potatoes. Who knew that in the recipe, you need to pay attention to the difference between a little tea and a big tea? <laughs> right? So instead of putting three teaspoons of salt into the cheesy potatoes, this dude put three tablespoons of salt into the cheesy potato. Yeah, I tried them. Nope, not eating that. Not competent right? Not able to make cheesy potatoes. Now, that's kind of a humorous way of looking at it. But wouldn't you agree that we're constantly asking ourselves, am I able? Am I competent? And the devil's lie is that my com confidence depends on my competence. Now, what do I mean by that? You see, we need to understand that God is the one who is fully competent, fully capable, fully able to save and send us. That you can't save yourself. Maybe some of you haven't even thought about it lately. But maybe you're, you're kind of tired of carrying around your sin and shame. 
Maybe you're kind of tired of trying to self-medicate the pain away. As I look around this room, I don't, I don't know all of your stories, but I know some of them. And I know some of you know some of my story. And I'm just telling you, it ain't pretty. You may think, oh, pastor, pastor's got it all together. No, he don't. I don't. Just ask my family. There are many, many, many days where I use my words to hurt instead of help. There are many, many days where I am ashamed of the way I act. Can you relate? And what Jesus is telling you is stop trying to be competent enough to be good enough to try to be able to earn God's favor because you're never going to earn it. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, right? God is able to save. He is the one who is competent. And he makes us competent then as we plug into his power. He makes us capable then to be able to serve the people around us. That's why I love this picture you know, if you've ever been on an airplane and, you know, there's so many people now that either have the earbuds in or a lot of them have that noise dampening or just, you know, canceling out, noise canceling earbuds now. And so you listen, you just want to tune in to whatever is coming through your phone, right? And tune out all the other noise. That's what God wants you to do. Turn down the volume of what culture tells you you are. Turn down the volume of what you say to yourself you are, like I am what I do or I am what I have. What happens when you don't perform the way that you want to? What happens when you lose those things that define you? And God is saying, your identity is secure in me. God is saying, your destiny is secure in me. God is saying, your purpose is secure in me. You have great meaning as you put my love into practice in your life. Not in order to be saved, but because you're saved. Changes everything. And that's why the Apostle Paul, in a different letter in the church to Galatia, was writing to people who were forgetting that. He was writing to people in Galatia who were saying, oh, no, 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 maybe we need to, to try to earn our way into God's good graces. And he's saying, hey, just remember who you are and remember whose you are. In Galatians 3, he says this, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. In just a moment, I think we're going to have 10 people up here being baptized in just a moment. I'm so excited for them because what baptism does is it is God making us a part of his family. It is God reminding us that in the blood of Jesus who paid the price for our forgiveness, our sins are washed away. It's God empowering us for purpose to be able to love others as he first loved us. That, my friends, is why I love what we get to do each and every day with our kids here at Mount Lebanon Lutheran School. You heard a moment ago that this is Disciples, Heirs, Leaders Sunday. And so we always like to ask our kids key questions about their identity, about their destiny, and about their purpose. And these are key questions that I invite you today to think about. And to answer. And so we're going to speak, after I ask the question, who are you? We're going to speak these words out loud for each of the three questions, okay? And by the way, Mount Lebanon scholars, you can lead us because you know these questions. You know the answers to these questions, right? So who are you? I am a child of God, an heir of eternity, loved and saved through Jesus. What are you called to do? I am called to be a disciple of Jesus with him living in me so that I can live for him. And how can you live for Jesus? With the power and forgiveness of Jesus, I can be a leader by serving God and others. Did you hear it? Identity, 
destiny, purpose. It's not based on how good you are. It's not based on what you think about yourself and all the self-talk, all those voices from our culture and from yourself that flood your brain. Don't let your brain become the devil's toolbox. Shut him out. Shut him off. Turn on Jesus. He gives you confidence and he empowers you with divine power to be competent, to put his love into practice each and every day. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.